Gentleman from Virginia, Seekerson. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I ask to address the House for one minute, minute for the purpose of inquiring about next week's schedule. Without objection, the gentleman is recognized. I thank the Speaker, and I yield to the gentleman from Maryland, the Majority Leader, for the purposes of announcing next week's schedule. I thank the gentleman for yielding. On Tuesday, the House will meet at 12.30 p.m. for morning hour, debate and 2 p.m. for legislative business, with votes postponed until 6.30 p.m. On Wednesday and Thursday, the, uh, Mr. Speaker, the House will meet at 10 a.m. for legislative business. On Friday, the House will meet at 9 a.m. for legislative business. Uh, we will consider several bills under suspension of the rules. The complete list of suspensions will be announced by the close of business tomorrow. In addition, Mr. Speaker, we will consider Senate amendments to H.R. 4213, uh, the American Jobs Closing Tax Loopholes and Preventing Outsourcing Act. I yield back. I th thank you, gentlemen. Mr. Speaker, um, I I'd ask the gentleman, uh, given the fact that we, he has announced only one rule bill for next week, I'd ask the gentleman if he expects the House to be in, uh, in session next Friday. And I yield. I uh, thank the gentleman for yielding. I want to tell the gentleman, although I announced uh, only the uh, American's Job uh, Bill, Closing Tax Loopholes and Preventing Outsourcing Act, uh, my expectation is we will also uh, deal with the Competes Act uh, next week as well. Uh, that bill, we believe, is a very important bill. Uh, we think it's uh, very important for jobs. We think it's very important for investing in our future. Uh, and uh, we intend to bring that bill uh, to the floor as well uh, next week. I, I thank the gentleman. Uh, Mr. Speaker, in keeping with the gentleman's announcement about next week's floor schedule, I'd also like to uh, announce an additional item that we Republicans would like to see and will bring up for a vote on the House floor next week. Yesterday, House Republicans launched an unprecedented online effort called UCUT. And this can be found at republicanwhip.house.gov slash UCUT. This program allows the public to vote on wasteful programs they'd like to see the House cut. Over 70,000 Americans have thus far voted in the program called UCUT. I'd say, Mr. Speaker, we will announce the public's choice this coming Monday and then provide for debate on the cut of their choosing during our first rule bill of the week, which, as the gentleman has indicated, the tax extenders. Uh, and, and, Mr. Speaker, therefore, I would say to the members uh, that in addition to the majority leader's announced schedule, there will also be a vote on the consideration of one of five possible savings proposals. The first is to eliminate the presidential election fund and that would amount to a $260 million saving. The next could be the elimination of the taxpayer subsidized union activities, a $600 million savings to the taxpayers. Next could be the elimination of a HUD program that funds doctoral dissertations. That is a $1 million savings to the taxpayers. Also, we could see the people of this country vote for the elimination of new non-reform welfare programs that could save the public three and a half billion dollars. Uh, also, uh, Mr. Speaker, among the items that the American public is opining on right now online is a proposal to eliminate wealthy communities uh, from the CDBG program. That would offer a $2.6 billion savings to the taxpayers. Uh, so I say, Mr. Speaker, uh, we on the Republican side of the aisle, as I have told the gentleman before, stand ready to work with the majority uh, in, in hopes of trying to encourage uh, legislation that would reflect these cuts, encourage the majority to bring those to the floor. But having not uh, received any bit of cooperation or uh, at least recognition that we need to do something like that, uh, we intend to bring those vo votes forward uh, on, on these items and whichever items the American people uh, vote on first to the floor next week. Mr. Speaker, moving on to the gentleman's announced schedule, I noticed that the majority leader did not indicate whether we would consider a budget next week. It's now been four weeks since the April 15th deadline for completing a budget, and I'd ask the gentleman, uh, does he still consider a budget, does he still think that the House will consider a budget prior to Memorial Day, as he stated before, and I yield. I'm certainly hopeful that we will deal with the issue of uh, uh, spending levels uh, by the uh, 
uh, time we bring appropriation bills to the floor. Um, we are working on that. I will say to my friend who has just given us a, an exposition on his new program, uh, which is, uh, and he gave the uh, uh, website uh, address. Uh, I think that, uh, first of all, let me say that uh, we welcome uh, the interest in the Republican Party in uh, cutting spending. Uh, of course, spending was substantially increased when uh, you had the presidency in the House and the Senate, uh, very substantially. As you know, at twice the rate uh, that it was increased uh, during the Clinton administration. Uh, we also believe that uh, we're sure that many citizens have some very useful suggestions. Uh, I would also urge them to make their suggestions to the commission, which the president has appointed, to get a handle on not 16 one-hundredths of spending, uh, but on the real dollars that uh, confront us uh, and which uh, the American public are very concerned about. Um, the commission that the president has appointed is to look at how we can bring spending down, how we can uh, address the deficit, um, and uh, how we can get back to the place where we were in, at the end of 2000, at the end of the Clinton administration, when we had a $5.6 trillion surplus. Unfortunately, that surplus was turned into this administration inheriting in about a $5 trillion deficit while your party was in total control of the House, the Senate, uh, and the administration. Uh, but uh, we certainly look forward uh, to the suggestions uh, that you have or anybody has uh, in the public as to how we can bring uh, spending under control. Uh, your party has talked a lot about earmarks. Um, as the gentleman well knows, in 1994 there were some 4,000 earmarks between the uh, for our 50 states and 435 districts. Um, that was escalated under Republicans uh, to 15,000, uh, quadrupled the number of earmarks. Now the gentleman is against earmarks, uh, uh, at least uh, wants a suspension of those. Uh, we think that that uh, is uh, perhaps progress. Um, but I want to tell the gentleman that we hope you will cooperate uh, with us in the uh, uh, findings of the commission. Uh, you have three very outstanding members that have been appointed from this House. Hopefully they will make substantive suggestions to get the budget deficit under control, as was done in the 1990s, a win for the first time in, in your lifetime and in mine. And I have a lot more lifetime to count than you do. Uh, we had a balanced budget. Uh, for four years in a row. That's never happened in your lifetime or in mine, other than uh, uh, during the Clinton administration. Uh, that was important. Unfortunately, uh, in the uh, following decade that we've just been through, again, the deficit was exploded. Uh, but uh, certainly any efforts to get suggestions from anybody, including the American public, of how they think that uh, we can uh, reduce uh, spending, uh, bring the deficit under control, is welcome, and uh, we look forward to uh, uh, hearing uh, suggestions. But I want to say that uh, uh, while some of the programs you have mentioned, I have one of those programs being a $200,000 program. You say it's a million-dollar program. In either event, it's cer certainly worth looking at uh, to see whether it has value uh, to invest uh, dollars in. But uh, you and I both know that in a $3.56 trillion program, uh, budget deficit, that we have to look at the big numbers, where we're spending money, and uh, what policies we've adopted uh, in order to get to where I think all of us want to be, and that's back to where we were uh, in uh, fiscal year uh, 97, 98, 99, and 2000. I yield. I, I thank the gentleman from, uh, for his sentiments. I, I would say, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, that first of all, if we can't start here and instead have to wait until after the upcoming election, what does that say to the American people? I also have noted that the gentleman has issued statements about the relative size of uh, the proposed options online under the UCUT program. And nowhere else 
Nowhere else but Washington could these cuts be deemed to not be significant. Just because they're less than 1% of the federal budget doesn't mean we ought not at least start there rather than kick the can down the road like Washington has under both parties' leadership. And the gentleman knows I am the first to admit that our party was fired in 06, much on account of the, of the runaway spending. But we have an opportunity to work together to actually begin some progress rather than continue to say let's shift the responsibility outside to a commission that the president has created. The facts are, Mr. Speaker, we've considered 63 resolutions naming post offices this year, 62 resolutions congratulating sports teams, and we've even supported the designation of Pi Day. Yet you don't think, and I, I really can't imagine why, we wouldn't have time to debate proposals regarding the type of savings that I enumerated. And that's why, Mr. Speaker, I would ask the gentleman, if he doesn't want to engage in the votes that we are going to present next week, why can't we have a bill brought to the floor with these measures? He and I can sit here and debate in the colloquy, but I think the American people would like to see the House actually engage uh, in these debates. So I, again, I appreciate the gentleman's indication that he wants to work with us, but time and again, we see ourselves here on this House floor taking up resolutions naming post offices instead of trying to do the people's business, emphasizing their priority, which is let's do something to cut the debt that is being imposed on our kids and their kids once and for all. Will the gentleman yield? I yield. We've done some very substantive things, most of which your party has opposed. Uh, we passed uh, last year. Uh, the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act. I don't know whether you had the opportunity to, uh, which you voted against, and which your party voted to a person against. Uh, I don't know whether you happened to see that as a result of that act, uh, people last year paid the lowest tax uh, rates uh, that they had paid since 1950. Uh, we reduced over $300 billion in taxes for individuals and small business. Now, you can make fun of the resolutions that your party uh, uh, introduces in my party uh, uh, congratulating people for uh, things or noting uh, uh, that post offices are being renamed uh, or things of that nature. Uh, but uh, that's a ruse. Uh, that's not the substance of what we do here. Uh, members want to acknowledge uh, their hometown folks. Uh, I've been in the legislature for a long period of time. They did that in the state senate. They do it here. Uh, and uh, sometimes it's easy to make fun of. But we've done some very substantive things. The gentleman knows that. It's one of the most productive Congresses uh, that I've served in uh, over the last 30 years uh, in terms of very important pieces of legislation. Uh, your party has voted uh, in many instances against that legislation. Uh, the proof of the pudding, of course, is it's eating. You didn't ask me where the jobs are uh, this time, as you usually do. Uh, the 290,000 new jobs uh, are created, 230,000 jobs the year before that, uh, the month before that, and an average of 100,000 jobs have been created uh, per month over the last four months. The gentleman over the last four months has mentioned jobs, uh, apparently because he thinks perhaps we found them, uh, where, frankly, the previous administration lost them uh, wherever they were lost. Uh, we need to bring them back. We are investing in bills uh, to get jobs back. We're investing in making sure that people who have lost their jobs uh, have some sustenance to support themselves and their families. We don't think that's de minimis uh, legislation. We think it's critically important. We have, we're passing legislation uh, to make sure that people have health care, uh, that when they lose their job, they lose their insurance, they get sick, uh, that uh, they have a COBRA coverage uh, that they could count on. We don't think that's de minimis. We're uh, uh, working on legislation to make sure the docs uh, get uh, reimbursed at appropriate levels so they'll continue to serve the seniors of America under Medicare. We don't think that's de minimis action. Uh, now, I could go on and on, as I'm sure you know and probably our, my colleagues know, but we believe we're passing 
a lot of legislation to respond to a deep crisis of economic uh, depths, unknown since uh, uh, 75 years ago in the Great Depression, uh, that we inherited and we're trying to respond to. And we're now creating jobs. We're now expanding the economy. Uh, somebody that you may agree with most of the time, Larry Kudlow said, you ought to stop talking down the economy. The facts speak for themselves. Uh, GDP growth for three quarters in a row, uh, jobs being uh, created, stock market up and down and up, little glitches, um, but it's up uh, uh, some 70% uh, on the Dow, 80% on the S&P, and uh, almost 100% on the NASDAQ. None of that, we think, is de minimis, I tell my friend. And, to, and both sides, by the way, do what you just did. Uh, we did it uh, to you, and we made fun of these little resolutions that don't take much time but are meaningful to the uh, constituencies that hear about them and appreciate the fact that their efforts uh, uh, throughout the country were acknowledged in one way or another or that uh, somebody that has great respect in their community uh, was honored. Uh, many soldiers uh, uh, and sailors and airmen and uh, uh, Marines are being honored by having post office named uh, for them in their communities. Uh, others are being honored, so that uh, I, t I tell my friend, uh, we need to be serious. We need to be serious. We have a critical deficit uh, confronting us. We have a critical long-term deficit confronting us. We have a critical uh, problem of an unsustainable entitlement uh, uh, regime uh, confronting us. The Peterson Institute is running uh, hearings all over this country to say, Americans, tell us what you think. I don't think your idea is a bad idea of asking Americans. We all want to ask Americans, what do you think so we can come together to solve what we both agree is a very serious economic uh, ditch into which we have uh, uh, fallen? We need to get out of it. We need to work together to do that. The American public expects us I, to I, do that. I thank the gentleman. And, Mr. Speaker, I would say, first of all, I think the gentleman knows that I have never never rooted against this economy or this country and in fact I've gone out of my way to make public statements when we have positive job growth to say when we see jobs growing it is a good thing period and I have been consistent in that message so I just wanted to speak to that and correct the gentleman's assertion that somehow I'm not giving credit for job growth Whether but I would say I'll yield in a second Mr. Speaker uh, I would say we do have much work to be done uh, and he indicates that somehow this last year was a year that Americans paid lower taxes than ever before in recent memory. I would say they paid lower taxes because we have a progressive tax system and the fact that the re recession reduced income by over $200 billion last year versus 2008. That's the reality. If you want to get serious, that is the reality. Not some uh, fan fantasy that we have somehow lowered tax rates when we know good and well at the end of this year tax rates are expected to skyrocket again on top of what we've just done with the new entitlement bill and the health care bill. So I would say to the gentleman, I am not questioning his intentions. I am not saying that there haven't been substantive proposals brought to the floor. I'm saying there have been a disproportionate number of times we've been on the floor doing things that we could have been spending time on others to do more productive things for the people of this country. I agree. The gentleman says we are at a crossroads. Yes, we are. And the problem is with the substance and the policy proposals that the gentleman and his party have been brought, bringing to the floor of the last year and a half have serious consequences. And they are aggravating the future prospects for growth in this country. He just indicated, Mr. Speaker, that entitlements, if we don't get a handle on entitlements, we could see our standard of living go down. Well, you're absolutely right, Mr. Speaker. The gentleman's correct on that. But what did we just pass a few months ago? The largest entitlement ever. So again, we can say things and we can have good intentions, but when they're matched with the deeds, something just doesn't add up. And I would say, Mr. Speaker, the issue is about spending. It is about the debt we are amassing. So when this gentleman points out that they brought to the floor the stimulus bill of 800 and some billion dollars, that has proven not to be a good quote-unquote investment and in fact 
has now saddled our kids and their kids with even more debt and sent the signal to the global investment community that America may have trouble paying its bills. Well, the gentleman That's yield. why we are intent on trying to bring forward the U-cut proposals to begin changing the culture here in this town, in this body, to begin to save taxpayer dollars, not with an emphasis on spending. And I yield. I thank the gentleman for yielding. And, you know, I, 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 maybe the public gets uh, tired of this uh, uh, back and forth, but uh, the gentleman talks uh, in, in ways that uh, indicate that all of a sudden in uh, 09, uh, January, when President Obama took office, somehow the world fell apart. In point of fact, as the gentleman knows, uh, in the last year of the Clinton administration, we gained 1.9 million new jobs. In the last year of the Bush administration, uh, under the policies that the gentleman supported and his party was very enthusiastic about, we lost 3.8 million jobs. That's a 5.7 million job turnaround. Yes, we were in dire straits. And conservative economists, Republican economists, uh, Mr. Zandi and others, uh, as well as uh, progressive economists, liberal economists, call them what you will, all said, if you do not invest in this economy, if you do not invest in stabilizing this economy, very frankly, you're going to lose 800,000 in additional revenues which meant that you would be in the same debt position whether you invested that money or didn't. Now, in investing that money, I say to my friend, with all but maybe two months, over the last 15 months, we have had a straight line out of the 800, almost 800,000 jobs that, under your policies, were lost in the last month of the Bush administration, almost 800. 100,000 jobs. We've been on a straight line to now where the last uh, five of the last six months, we've had positive job growth. Is it enough? It is not. Should we do more? We should. Should we cooperate in doing that? Absolutely. That's what the American public expects us to do. But don't forget the facts of how we got here. Don't forget the fact that an awful lot of economists on your side of the aisle said we needed to invest uh, or the economy was going to fall even further. And we wouldn't have that straight line of out of the depths of loss of jobs into the positive numbers of creating uh, jobs. Let me also say to you, uh, you mentioned taxes. Uh, and you mentioned the fact that uh, somehow it was because incomes fell. Incomes did fall, and that was unfortunate. Uh, they fell because of, we believe, we don't, we don't agree on this, is because of the economic policies that were pursued. And we think uh, our facts are, are valid. I will remind you, 216,000 jobs per month for 96 months under the Clinton administration. Average, 216,000. 21 months of over 400,000 uh, jobs. The Bush administration had five of those months. And the Bush administration's average job creation over 96 months was 11,000 jobs. 216,000 versus 11,000 jobs. So the economy was in great distress. Yes, we had to invest. Yes, we had to borrow. Because if we didn't, our grandchildren, and I have grandchildren, uh, I have a great grandchild. I'm very worried about what they're going to inherit. And I knew that we could not allow the economy to fall through the roof or fall through the uh, floor. But let me say this. This is from uh, USA Today, uh, from uh, an article that appeared, taxes paid have fallen much faster than income in this recession. Your proposition was taxes fell because income fell. Personal income fell 2% last year. That's 2% too much. Actually, it's about 10% too much because we would have hoped they would have gone up 5 or 6 or 7%. But now listen to this next sentence. I know you want to get this next sentence. Taxes paid dropped 23%. The BEA classifies Social Security taxes as insurance pay payments. Uh, so I, I tell my friend, we inherited a terrible economy uh, from the Bush administration. Uh, and we have been working very hard to bring it back. And every, almost every indication indicates that, in fact, it is coming back. Uh, we invested in trying to keep the automobile companies employing people. 
uh, and they are doing that. So I tell my friend that, uh, you know, I did not, as you recall, imply that you had talked down the economy. What I said was Larry Kudlow, talking to, the, to his fellow conservatives, said, don't do it because the facts don't uh, warrant that kind of attack. So we're going to continue to work. We want to work with you. Uh, we want to get this economy moving. We want to create jobs. Uh, you'll have legislation on the floor uh, next week. Hopefully you'll work with us uh, that we think will do that. It'll create summer jobs. Uh, it'll uh, invest in infrastructure uh, with the uh, uh, America Bonds program. Uh, so there are a number of things that you'll have an opportunity to vote on next week. Hopefully you'll join us, uh, which are going to stabilize, uh, continuing to stabilize those who don't have jobs and to create jobs uh, for them uh, in the new economy. Well, I, I thank the gentleman, and, and I know that the gentleman knows, having quoted the article that he did, in that same article, uh, the, uh, the writer gives a lot of credit to the impact of the so-called Bush tax cuts as being economically gener generative, causing some of the positive results. Uh, but let's just point out, in all fairness and transparency, at the end well, of the this gentleman year... Yield, just on that, are you referring to the paragraph that says... Uh, Presidents Clinton and Bush pushed through a series of tax changes, credits, lower rates, higher exemptions that slashed income taxes for poor and middle class families. That is correct. I would say the gentleman, I am referring to that. And so while we are on that subject, we know very well, there's been no indication whatsoever that the, that the ability for entrepreneurs to continue to experience um, uh, an atmosphere that is conducive to their investment and assumption of risk will continue because we are facing the largest tax hike in American history at the end of this year, and the majority has been unwilling to say that is not coming. That is hanging over this economy as a veil of uncertainty, and I would say to the gentleman, if he is so excited about the positive results that he indicates, largely due to the fiscal policies in place that will be not in place after the end of this year, I would say that maybe we should consider extending the rate cuts in cap gains and dividends and marginal rate reductions that are in place now. Uh, I would also say to the point? gentleman, uh, listen, we, we, we have been now for weeks, months, uh, been through this, your fault, our fault, your fault, our fault. The public and the American people are upset. They don't want blame game anymore. They want us to stop the spending. And just next week, the gentleman's talking again about bringing more spending. And he indicates that all economists supported the stimulus bill. He knows that's not true, but like a good lawyer, he's going to present his case. But what I would say to the gentleman, let's stop the spending now. That's why we have started and launched the U-Cut program. And if he alleges an incremental modest steps, fine. Join us in that. But let's stop the spending, Mr. Speaker. I would ask the gentleman, he had mentioned the tax... Will the gentleman yield? Yield. I yield. What, uh, I don't want to get too personal on this, but what do you think about cutting the spending for the high-speed rail between Richmond and Washington? Well, I, I would say the gentleman, uh, I have always, way before uh, we have uh, even encountered that stimulus bill, supported job-generating projects. <laughs> the studies in, in the metropolitan area that, from which I come and represent indicate no? Virginia could grow 165,000 jobs with that kind of investment. That's always been my position. Get, but when we're looking at some of the items that we're discussing here on the U-cut uh, options, these are items that are niceties. They don't, they may be well-intentioned. But if we're worried about job creation and we're worried about deficits growing, we ought to begin to take action now. I'd ask the gentleman, uh, he mentioned the tax extenders bill for next week, and I would wonder if he could tell us the content of that bill. Will there be a markup on the bill? Uh, reports have indicated, and perhaps the gentleman has said, uh, that the bill will be nearly $200 billion and what kind of rule, whether it be open or not, would he expect? And I yield. I don't think I mentioned a figure on the extenders. I'm pretty sure I did not, not today uh, or, frankly, any other day, but uh, because it hasn't been finally completed by the uh, Ways and Means Committee. 
As you know, they're working with the uh, Senate Finance Committee as well and working with Republicans. Uh, as you know, this was a bipartisan bill when it came from the Senate. Uh, Republicans supported it, and uh, we hope it's a bipartisan bill as it leaves here. Uh, but let me say the package the Senate Senate sent us uh, we're, we're working on. Um, we, uh, uh, the process uh, that we will consider it has not yet been finally determined, so I can't tell the gentleman exactly what that will be, but uh, some of the things I've already mentioned that would be in it, uh, UI and COBRA, FMAP, uh, Build America Bonds for Local Infrastructure Programs, Summer Jobs Program, so we can uh, get young people uh, to work this summer so that they will have some livelihood and can help their families who are in distress. Uh, and uh, uh, we also, as I said, are going to deal with the SGR to ensure seniors uh, can keep their doctors. And uh, we'll conclude provisions to close tax loopholes, crack down on outsourcing of jobs overseas, and protect American jobs here at home. Uh, those are all things that I think will be in it. That's not necessarily an exclusive list, but that certainly is uh, uh, a, a bill that we think will be uh, pro-business in cutting in, in confirming many of the tax benefits that are given to businesses, as you well know, uh, that we regularly uh, continue, including the investment tax credit, so that uh, we can encourage businesses to uh, grow and invest and uh, to create jobs. So that is an outline of it. Uh, the process has not yet been decided. I'm sure there'll be discussions about that tomorrow with the Rules Committee Chair uh, and with the committee, and uh, perhaps we can uh, no, so, at a later date. Again, just to clarify, uh, Mr. Speaker, does that mean that the bill will not go through committee? And I yield. The uh, uh, bill, I think, is, uh, as you know, a bill over from the Senate uh, that uh, was bipartisan in nature. And I think that uh, we need to move this bill before Memorial Day. And I think that the uh, committee is going to have to decide how to get that done in the in the fastest way possible, so that. Many of the expiring uh, issues do not expire, uh, that which would be very detrimental to uh, uh, to docs, uh, to to many other people. I thank the gentleman, Mr. Speaker. The gentleman and I have been working together for some months now on the Iran sanctions bill, and also crucial to the national security of this country is the war supplemental. Uh, he has indicated before. Uh, that the Iran sanctions conference report and the war supplemental would be coming to the House floor prior to Memorial Day recess, and I'd ask whether that still is the case, and I yield. I thank the gentleman. Uh, I'm sure everybody's listening now will be glad to hear that there is some cooperation and agreement. Uh, the gentleman and I are both strong supporters of the Iran sanction uh, legislation. Uh, we believe that uh, not only is the Middle East region at risk, but the international community is at risk as long as Iran is pursuing uh, its uh, intent to uh, arm itself with nuclear uh, weapons. Uh, I tell the gentleman that uh, it, uh, I've been working very closely with Mr. Berman, uh, and it is my hope and expectation that this uh, conference report will be reported back to us before the Memorial Day break, and uh, it is my intention to work towards having that uh, sent to the President before we leave here. For the Memorial Day break. Uh, uh, and I would ask, uh, Mr. Speaker, it, would the same be for the supplemental as well before Memorial Day recess? And I yield. I, I, not, I don't think the same would be because of both the Senate and the House. I'm hopeful that we will pass the supplemental through the House, but uh, it won't be in the same position because we haven't had a conference on the supplemental. It'll be the Senate's working on a bill, as the gentleman knows. We're working on a bill. Uh, it, I have talked to the uh, uh, chairman, and he is trying to get uh, uh, the matter together for the committee, and I am hopeful that we will pass it through the House, uh, and my uh, urging is that we pass it through the House prior to the Memorial Day break. But obviously, the gentleman knows we will not have affected a conference by that time, uh, but we want to do so uh, very shortly because, clearly, we need to make sure the resources are available for our men and women in harm's way in both uh, Iraq uh, and Afghanistan and in other troubled spots of the world. I thank, thank the gentleman, Mr. Speaker. And in closing, I'd like, 
I look forward to continuing to work with the gentleman in a fiscally <laughs> responsible manner, uh, which starts with passing a budget blueprint for this year, just like American families have to do. I thank the gentleman once again for his time, and I yield back. The gentleman.